Thanks for the intro, Sarah, and thanks for inviting me to present today. This is very exciting. Um, I'm assuming you can all see my screen. Let me just go full screen. Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking about a pretty weird phenotype in bacteria, which is mass cell suicide. And I should probably say that all of this is uh, published, so if, feel free to tweet about it or check out the paper if you want um, a little bit more information. Um, sorry. Okay, so as most of you probably know, um, bacteria in nature live in these really high density multi-genotype environments where they're pretty much constantly interacting with each other. And so since there's often limited nutrients and limited space in these environments, there's really strong selection pressure to be a good competitor in the face of these um, limitations. And so one way of being a good competitor is finding a way to killing or inhibiting your competitors. And many bacteria have evolved to do just that. So they've evolved different um, molecular weapon systems that they can use against their competitors. And I'm broadly categorizing them here by whether they're contact dependent or contact independent. So the contact dependent ones in the top row really rely on the attacker cell sitting right next to the target cell. Um, so this only allows for really short range interactions. And the contact independent systems in the bottom row here don't have that restriction. So they rely on diffusible toxic molecules. And so they allow for interactions to happen between cells that are actually um, really far away from each other in some scenarios. And so the system I'm going to talk about today lives in this category down here, which is diffusible protein toxins. Seems like my click is kind of delayed. Okay, so let's look at a simple example of intera interaction based on diffusible toxins. Here we're looking at two E. coli colonies growing side by side, each producing a different toxin, and toxin production is labeled green here. So if we let these guys interact for a couple of hours, we see that there's this death zone forming at the interface between the two colonies, so clearly there's a lot of death happening on both sides here during this interaction. And these strains specifically are producing colocines, so these are bactericin toxins produced by E. coli, as the name suggests. And uh, they're characterized by their extremely narrow killing spectrum. So they're pretty much only useful if you want to kill a strain that's really closely related or a closely related species. And even more specifically, these two strains are producing colicines E2 and E8. And I'm going to be referring to these labels throughout the presentation, so it's worth keeping these names in mind. And E2 and E8 are both DNases. So their mechanism of action is that they enter the target cell through the membrane and then they non-specifically degrade that target cell's DNA. So it's pretty straightforward, it just chops up the DNA. And these colocenes are produced and upregulated when the cells are sensing DNA damage. So it's kind of this feedback loop kind of thing where they sense an incoming DNA's toxin, they sense the DNA damage that they're experiencing, and then in response to that, they upregulate their own toxin production, which is also a DNA. So you're gonna kind of get this positive feedback loop going between these two strains, with DNA damage being the crucial link here. So it's a way for the cells to sense a competitor that's making a DNA's toxin that's attacking their DNA, and then mounting a counterattack by producing their own toxins. So if we look at this death zone in the middle between these two colonies, um, it's straightforward to think about um, death here in the sense that they just killed each other, right? Because they're producing two different toxins, they're probably sensitive, so that pre seems pretty straightforward. But it's actually not that simple because these colicine toxins are released via cell suicide. So the cells actually spend some time producing these colicines, they accumulate them in their cytoplasm, and then at some point they flip a switch, they permeabilize their own membrane, so they lyse themselves, they kill themselves, and then all of the colicine toxins they produce get released into the environment at the same time. So it's a suicidal way of releasing toxins. And knowing that, if we look at this death zone again, we might ask, okay, well, what's actually happening here then? So if we have a dead cell, was, is that cell dead because it was killed by a competitor? Or is it dead because it wanted to attack the competitor and that also killed it because it's a suicidal way of releasing your own toxins? So essentially the question is, is this really mass cell suicide that we're looking at? Or are we simply looking at sort of widespread killing on both sides of the equation here? And to answer that question, we needed to, to find a way to specifically label cells that lies to themselves, but not cells that were killed by a competitor. And so we developed a two-color essay to do just that. The first color is going to be a geo GFP reporter for our colicine promoter. So whenever the cells um, experience DNA damage, they're going to start producing their own colicines, and they're also going to start producing GFP, so we can tell they're turning green under the microscope. And then we added a compound called propidium iodide to the medium, which is a DNA dye, so it binds to DNA and then fluoresces, but it can only penetrate cells whose membrane is compromised, which is perfect for this scenario, because that's exactly what happens during the self lysis process. Um, so we can visualize self lysis happening by monitoring the appearance of these two signals. And we can contrast this dynamic with cells that 
um, did also experience DNA damage, but then got killed before they got to lyse themselves. So then these cells are just going to stay green forever. And also cells that were killed before any of that could happen, before they could even mount a stress response. So these cells are just straight up dead and they won't ever give a signal in any channel. So importantly, these two versions of cells that were killed by the competitor give you no propidium iodide signal whatsoever because they're being killed by DNases in my assays, which means the membrane is perfectly intact, um, which is actually crucial for this project because that allows us to really selectively only label cells that killed themselves and not the ones that were killed by the competitor. Okay, so now we had this reporter assay that was working, and in a first set of experiments, we wanted to expose this reporter strain to sterile supernatant made by a competitor that contains DNA's toxins. So we essentially put them on an agarose pad that's infused with supernatant, and we watch what happens. As you can see in this example time lapse, here they're reacting to colosin E8 toxins, which is a DNA's, and they're turning green and then pink, which tells us that they're really stressed, they're seeing a lot of DNA damage, and then they decide to self lyse in response to make their own toxins. And we can repeat this experiment. Um, by exposing them to different concentrations of toxins. So here on the x-axis, I'm plotting the, the amount of toxin stress that they're experiencing. Um, and then on the y-axis, the proportion of cells depending on their cell fate. So we're tracking single cells here. Then I'm plotting whether they're dividing, whether they're killed, or whether they self lysed At really high toxin concentrations, we pretty much only get cells straight up being killed. They can't even, they don't even get to self lyse As we lower the toxin concentration that they're experiencing, they, they, you see more self lyses and at some point, actually, the majority of the cells will self lyse As we lower the co toxin concentration even more, you get more divisions, which makes sense because now they're happier and they're less stressed. So we see this interesting phenomenon where we see peak self lysis So 86% of the population will kill itself at intermediate toxin concentrations, which was way more than we expected. But OK, that was cool. And then the next thing we wanted to check if that happens to the same degree at the interface between two interacting colonies, though, because this is a highly controlled experiment, might not represent nature necessarily. So next we went um, and looked at interacting colonies. And we asked, OK, if we zoom into the colony edge of a reporter strain that's experiencing a competitor growing right next to it where the toxin is kind of fusing over from the side how much lysis do we get so here we're going to look at a video where the competitor toxin is going to be flowing in from the left side and we can watch the cells react to that attack by a dnas and as you can see again the vast majority of cells turn first green and then pink which tells us that they experienced dna damage and then decided to self lyse in response and uh, release their own toxins i'm going to play that again you can kind of see the wave of toxins making its way through the colony here then we can also quantify this. So here I'm plotting percent cells lysed as a function of how far away we are from the colony edge, because this is where the competitor toxin first hits them. And we actually see peak self lysis at 99%, so pretty much every single cell self lysing, at intermediate um, distances from the colony edge. Because um, right at the very colony edge, a lot of cells die before they get to self lyse because toxin concentrations are highest and they see the toxin really early here. And then as we move further into the colony, the self lysis rate drops quite dramatically again, because now the cells see way less toxin. And so all of this was done in really thin kind of monolayer colonies to allow single cell tracking. And next we want to check if this also happens in sort of thicker three-dimensional colonies that are a bit more mature. And so we, we moved over to a confocal microscopy approach that allows us to track self lysis in 3D over time. So again, we're going to look at a colony edge that's re reacting to incoming competitor toxin. In the video I'm just about to show you, the competitor toxin is going to be flowing in from the lower left corner of the screen. And one comment here is that the GFP signal that you're about to see is actually a constitutive signal here, because um, we needed a label for just pure biomass in this assay in order to quantify self lysis. And so we're going to watch this sort of three dimensional wedge at the colony edge now um, react to the incoming competitor toxin. Um, so the frame rate is half an hour here. And over the first couple of hours, you can see that again, um, the vast majority of cells react to the competitor DNA's toxin with a self lysis response as evident by the propidium iodide signal, that's the purple thing here. And then we can again quantify this. So again, I'm plotting here biomass lysed in percent as a function of how far away the cells are from the colony edge where the colosine first hits, competitor colosine. And we see the exact same phenomenon, phenomenon, phenomenon where we see peak self lysis at intermediate distances from the colony edge, because at the very colony edge, they're getting hit so hard by the toxin that many of them lyse before they can do, uh, sorry, get killed before they can lyse. And then as we move further in towards the colony, you get lower lysis rates because now they're happier and they're seeing less toxin. Okay, so with this data set, I hope I've convinced you that mass cell suicide does indeed happen at the interface between two interacting toxin producers. But the next question that we had was actually, 
okay, that's cool and all, but how can that evolve? Because that seems really counterintuitive and weird to release a toxin suicidally while you're being attacked by a competitor that wants to kill you. So how can that be selected for? How can mass cell suicide actually evolve? And to answer that question, we actually went back to the very first experiment that I showed you where we exposed individual cells to sterile competitor supernatant at different concentrations. And we wanted to know, okay, these cells that self lies on mass here at intermediate toxin concentrations, what would have happened to them if they didn't have the ability to kill themselves? In other words, what are they giving up here by self lysing So we repeated this experiment with a strain that's genetically identical to this one, except for the fact that it can't kill itself. And what we saw was actually kind of quite surprising. Um, and that is that at intermediate toxin concentrations where we see all of the self lysis happening, this other strain that can't kill itself is just straight up dead. So what we think is happening is that these cells that self-lysed on mass here were experiencing a lethal amount of DNA damage from the competitor toxin. And so they weren't giving up any future reproductive potential by self-lysing, they would have died anyway. So might as well try to mount a counterattack response, which drastically reduces the evolutionary cost for this behavior. So essentially what we think is happening here is that if you have two clonal patches interacting and you have a competitor that's orange here starting to produce the toxin, you're going to end up with a death zone at the very colony edge where all of the cells, they see so much toxin that they're going to die at some point. But some of them, a subset of them in this death zone, get to mass, they get to engage in this mass self lysis response just before they die. And, they, and that allows them to mount this huge, intense counterattack where they release all of the toxins they made at the same time in the hopes of then defeating that competitor. So we do see local mass cell suicide, but importantly, we only see it in these moribund cells that are bound to die anyway, which we think drastically reduces the cost of this extreme behavior. And then the benefits of that intense counterattack, for example, inhibiting or killing this other competitor in orange, can then be shared among the surviving clone mates, because there's still plenty of cells behind the death zone that are happily surviving even after the initial attack. And since they're all clonal, those benefits are perfectly shared. So we think it's the combination of cost reduction by restricting mass suicide to moribund cells and then benefits being shared among clone mates that really allows the evolution of this very extreme counterattack um, phenotype. Okay, with that, I would like to thank the Foster Lab at Oxford for their help and support, um, Despina and Diego, former postdocs of the group who did a lot of the work leading up to this project, um, the ERC, the Welcome and the SNF for funding, and of course the MEE virtual um, organizers for putting together this amazing meeting. I'm really looking forward to the next couple of days. It's been great so far already, so props to them. And uh, yeah, thanks for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Hey, thanks a lot, Lisa. That was really exciting. I really like this story. So we have uh, a few questions now coming up on the, on the Q&A. So one that came from Nick Vega a little while ago, she was asking about the cells that still stay green um, so I think it was on the video where you show the, the edge of the colony and you show that some, most of the cells are going purple, but some are still green. And her question is, could they be defectors? So could they somehow be avoiding the, the suicide? Yeah, so maybe you can just go back to that video for a second. Um, I'm assuming that the person is talking about this video here where we're looking at a three- the one before. Oh, the one before, sorry, okay. Yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. So this one. And so the question is, what happens to the few cells that were green but never turned pink? Exactly. Okay, so maybe we can watch that video again. So there are a few cells that turn green and never turn pink. And we think what happens to them is that they actually died from the incoming DNA toxin. So they basically experienced so much DNA damage that they never, they had enough time to produce GFP and be stressed for a while, but they never got to, um, to actually mount the self lysis response where they turn pink. And so if they just die, that's the crucial bit, if they just die from the DNA's attack, there's one here, for example, that stays green. If they just die from the DNA's attack, they're gonna stay green. The GFP is contained in the cell because the membrane is still intact if you're being killed by DNA's and the PI never gets to leak in. So they're not defectors in that sense because they never had a choice. They just happen to experience higher toxin concentrations in that moment in time when they were slightly less you know, tolerant to DNA damage. DNA damage is also not exactly the same, is not tolerated the exact same way in, in, all, in every single cell. So there's some variability here. So we expect um, some of them to die before they get to respond. And those are the really green ones. Um, one other quick question. So, so 
Jonathan Friedman is asking, well, he says, great talk. And he's asking if you've checked if the, the self-lysing cells have a higher competitive fitness than the non-lysing ones. So have you done competitive assays? Yeah, so that was actually, yeah. So the fact that this behavior is beneficial was already known before. So I, if you post that question in the chat, I can point you to some studies. Um, so we haven't directly shown that in this study, but it was known before from other papers that engaging in this kind of crazy, insane counterattack suicidal toxin behavior is beneficial, but it depends on who you're attacking though. As usual, there's a trade-off for everything. So um, depending on who your competitor is, this might be a great strategy or it might not be a great strategy. Again, I can point you to, to those papers because those are um, those go a little bit deeper in terms of the discussion of that. Um, but so here we just showed basically um, how gene regulation and evolution ties in. Um, so we haven't directly shown the benefits of this behavior in this study. 